Welcome to this course about development with large language models, or LLMs. Throughout this course, you will complete hands-on projects that will help you learn how to harness the immense potential of LLMs for your own projects. You'll build projects with LLMs that will enable you to create dynamic interfaces, interact with vast amounts of text data, and even empower LLMs with the capability to browse the internet for research papers. You'll learn about the intricate workings of LLMs, from their historical origins to the algorithms that power models like GPT. Akshat is a passionate educator in the field, and he teaches this course. Hi. Welcome to this course on LLM engineering and development brought to you by loop.ai. My name is Akshat and I'm excited to be teaching you guys this course. So who should watch this? Anyone who's interested to learn hands-on LLM usage and theory through explanations and multiple guided projects paired with a fairly basic Python programming knowledge should be pretty comfortable following along. So here are all the projects that we're going to be working towards. We're going to be able to create a clone of the ChatGPT user interface along with the large language model that will help us interact with it with custom personas. We're going to be able to have conversations with our documents like text files and PDF files uh, that ChatGPT may have not been trained on. We're going to be able to use agents which are self-prompting large language models and enable these la large language models to browse the web and research and retrieve research papers using the archive API. We're going to be able to enable these large language models to use more than five tools in the real world, along with equipping them with our own custom tools. So here's all of the course content, and let's get started with the basic introduction to LLMs. So an LLM basically happens when you combine a massive neural network with huge amounts of data and train it on this huge amount of data. Once it's been trained, you then align it to human values in an attempt to create a reasoning engine. So examples of these LLMs are BERT, LAMA, and more famously, GPT-3.5 and GPT-4. So the concept of LLMs has been around since 1996, but why have they only recently gained traction? The reason why is because this is the first time in history where LLMs have been actually able to outperform human reasoning in certain contexts. And the reason for this is due to huge impor uh, improvements in performance and scale. Now more on scale. Uh, as you can see, modern LLMs like GPT 3.5 have a huge amount of um, money and scale that goes into developing them. GPT 3.5 has over 175 billion parameters and you can think of parameters as neurons in your brain. Along with this, it has huge amounts of training data. GPT 3.5 is not where this cycle of LLM development stops because OpenAI has another model called GPT 4 that is essentially an upgraded version of GPT 3.5 that performs all the tasks that GPT 3.5 can, but just seems to meet the goal a lot better. The reason for this is due to its huge amount of parameters, 1.76 trillion, and with this, it has the capacity to uh, undergo training with even greater amounts of training data. A huge model like this that's trained on a huge amount of training data is pretty dangerous to humanity. So the demand for aligning this model to human values and feedback is also very important and plays a very important role. Apart from GPT 3.5 and GPT 4 by OpenAI, there are several competitors in this landscape like Microsoft, Facebook, Google, who are all actively publishing research papers and breakthroughs pretty much every week at the time when this is recorded. So now let's look through some of the algorithmic breakthroughs that got us to this point. I'm going to go through these by explaining to you the typical architecture that you would follow uh, if you want to train your own custom large language model. So let's start with choosing the architecture and tokens. So a large language model you can think of is basically a mathematical function that has just learned to predict the right words given the or given some input context. And if you want to use this as a mathematical function, you'd obviously have to deal in numbers. So we use something called tokenization that converts a string of text into a vector of numbers. And so the tokenizer splits these words into individual 
um, elements and then assigns it a unique number. So once you've assigned the unique number, uh, you also need to tell the LLM when to actually stop generating or otherwise it'll be stuck in an input loop. And that's why you have this stop token here. So now let's look at the brain, which is actually what learns these relationships between words and predicts the right word. So you don't need to really know uh, all the complex math that goes in that gets involved in making this neural network for this course. But I'm just going to give you a quick intuition as to how this works. So let's say one of this input sequence like this word here uh, gets inputted. You can think of all these layers as random numbers initially. And what you can think of uh, them doing is just multiplying them, multiplying this input sequence uh, you know, these many times, and then you get an output. So obviously, if all these layers are set to random numbers, you're going to have a pretty bad and random guess. So what we do after we collect the output is we look at what word we actually want the model to output, and then we compute a difference between our output value that we predicted and the, the actual value that we need. Once we have that, the the algorithm takes note and it adjusts all of these parameters here uh, to step in that direction. So once that's done, we've pretty much finished one training step. And and adding to this overall scale concept, this whole training process occurs hundreds of billions of times. So you can imagine that even after the first 10 million iterations, it's going to get pretty good at guessing what the next word is supposed to be. So now more on the training problem I was just talking about. The way these large language models are trained is through a next word token prediction task, which basically gives the model the question as well as a blank that it's supposed to fill in. So here, obviously, the answer is book. So it's given all this context here, surrounding context, and it's asked to predict the word. So these these are just four questions here, but the model gets inputted billions of questions from data, uh, from co code to college textbooks to articles to lyrics to podcasts and pretty much any data that you can scrape off the internet. So good. So now we've effectively trained this model that can predict the next token in a sequence. But this is still very limiting because it's just one token. We want we want our LLM to ideally express ideas and thoughts and actually reason. So the way we do that is by actually predicting this next token here and then inputting the predicted token back into the model so that it can predict again. And you just keep you know, collecting these predictions and you'll get a string of text. And um, going back to the stop token, this is where it's important because once the model is finished with the thought, it needs to be informed that um, you know, you should just stop the th thought. So great. So now we have this huge LLM that's been trained on a bunch of different data and we can use it as a reasoning engine, but maybe the LLM doesn't have the knowledge that it needs in order to work in your specific use case. And this is where fine tuning comes in. Fine tuning, um, fine, you can use fine tuning to further train a model to your own personal context. And this is good because you don't need that much data anymore. You just need a small label corpus of your example data. And examples of something that you can use fine tuning for is generating custom mid journey or image generation prompts for another model, as well as letting it learn information beyond its knowledge cutoff. So, you know, say um, you wanted to teach it about the latest cancer research. So a quick note here, uh, the second example where you're actually teaching it information, it's not the most efficient uh, when you fine tune. We're going to be using a much better method called vector databases in this course. Uh, more on that later. But generally, you'd fine tune if you want to change its behavior, like this example here. So now that we have this model with its optional fine tuning, you can further take this to production and make it safe so that it doesn't um, spew out harmful content through RLHF, which is reinforcement learning from human feedback. The reason we do this is because the, the training data that we scrape comes from a bunch of different sources like articles, 
podcasts, textbooks, lyrics, etc. And this data is bound to have a lot of bias in it. And alignment with human values basically fine tunes it to remove the bias. So here's um, here's what they do, what OpenAI does to uh, fix this issue. So basically, it's uh, it uses a human labeler to just get safe output and reinforce the model to output these safe uh, tokens. Okay, so now we pretty much went through the entire pipeline, which is everything from training to fine tuning to uh, aligning to human values. And now we're gonna actually look into how to get the output from our models. So the the question that you asked, the process of asking a large language model a question is called prompting. And the model generates something called a completion, which is just a string of text that's likely to complete your previous text. Inference parameters are another technique that you can use to enhance the creativeness of the model. And we'll be trying this out in the chat GPT playground, but these are the four uh, parameters you can change. So these two basically make your outputs more random by changing a lot of things like the window for the probable words to uh, how much the low probability words are weighted. And frequency parity and presence parity are the other two inference parameters. And they basically make sure that your model doesn't output the same answer in the same style uh, for every single uh, qu qu for every single identical question that you ask it. So now let's go ahead and try this out in the chat GPT playground. So a quick note from this future, uh, if you already know the basics of chat GPT and calling the API, you should skip the next two sections and come to the third section where we'll be learning how to clone the entire chat GPT user interface. So now let's explore the playground environment. So in your browser, just type in chat GPT playground and you should be prompted with this user interface here. Another way you could do this is just through the OpenAI website itself, where you just log in. And go. Okay. And just hit API here. And just hit playground. Okay. So the reason why we're choosing to use the playground over the usual chat GPT user interface is because the playground will give us a more uh, customizability as well as a better feel for the actual API that we're going to be using throughout this course. So let's get started from um, left to right. In this column here, you can add in your system message. Uh, you can say you are a programmer, something like that. And basically the system message assigns the uh, LLM's personality throughout the entire conversation. So here you can maybe say something like, uh, hi, print out the first 10 digits of the report sequence listing. And it should give me some output. So as you can see, it does give us the output. And one thing to notice here is that there's always an alternation between the user and the assistant. And so in the API as well, when we script some kind of conversation, we're going to be using this. So just remember that it's only valid. If it's user followed by assistant. So now let's move on to this main column here that is going to let us customize a bunch of different parameters. So uh, it's it's generally recommended to keep the mode in chat, but you can explore the models here. And we have options between the versions of the GPT 3.5 line and the GPT 4 line. And basically, the difference between GPT 4 and GPT 3.5 is uh, GPT 4 is slower, but it's a lot better at logical reasoning and creativity related tasks because it's just trained on so much data. and GPT 3.5 is obviously the opposite. It's faster, but it's it's a little worse at uh, you know, these tasks. And so there's a speed off. Uh, there's a trade off between intelligence and speed here. But in general, I would recommend using GPT 4. 
So we can just give it another message, maybe like write a poem. And yeah, so as you can see, uh, the previous stuff was so much faster than how it's outputting now. And this process of like stringing together these texts live is called streaming, where you're not uh, you're not just presenting uh, the whole text after it's all done processing. You're just doing it live. You're just putting it together. So now, once we have this, we can actually change some of the other parameters here, these impress parameters. So temperature is a measure of creativity, as I've mentioned before. So when you put temperature at zero, it's very deterministic. So it's useful when you're trying to just try to understand some kind of data and when temperature equals one it's a lot more creative so you can you know use it for a bunch of different uh poem writing or just just like arguments in general maximum length is pretty obvious and so just we can uh, just test out the deterministic part of this by comparing to output so we can write write code for uh thing sorting and array from scratch so i'll just copy this and uh, submit this and while that's executing uh, i'll just go over like toppy is another example uh, that allows us to control the modern's creativity and it's only advised to use one of these parameters uh, at a time uh, either temperature or toppy so moving on, we have frequency penalty and presence penalty. And if you want the model to output a different answer for every same question, or just cut down the number of repeated words in an answer, you'd use this frequency penalty. So anyway, let's just, so we did this when temperature equals zero. So now let's compare this output to when temperature equals uh, something higher like one. So while that's happening, uh, as I said before, frequency penalty uh, basically penalizes based on how often a word occurs, a uh, repeated word occurs, and presence penalty penalizes the model based on uh, just whether or not the word exists. So uh, let's just compare these two uh, outputs with different temperatures. So here the algorithm is using bubble sort, but here the algorithm is using um, selection sort. So as you can see, the Although the answers will be correct, the way it approaches these answers is going to be wildly different based on the temperature or the top P. So another quick thing that we can do here that makes our life a lot easier is when we want to use this in the code, which we'll get to in the next session, you can just hit this review code button. It'll give us everything that we actually need to get started. So all we have to do is just copy this code and I'll see you in the next video where we're actually going to work through this API in our Jupyter notebook. You should find this notebook linked in the description below. And this is something, this is called a Colab notebook, which is just an online environment that helps us run our Python code. So to get started, all you have to do is just press shift and enter. And it you, know, you can just go through all this Colab notebook. So we'll just wait for all the necessary Python pa packages to install. And these packages basically let us call the OpenAI API and actually access ChatGPT. So let's just wait for that to finish. And let's go through what this Open API key means. We got black for now. Okay. So now let's move on to this API key. And so what is an API key? Since OpenAI builds you on using the API, you'll need a password so that no one can get access to this but you. And that's what the API key is. It's just a password to your API. So obviously, I'm going to be revealing this password to you guys, but I'm going to deactivate it as soon as this tutorial ends. So I'm going to to show you guys how to do all of that. So you don't have to worry even if uh, someone gets access to this key, you can just disable it. So what you would do is you would go out to your, uh, you know, 
this account and you would hit view API keys. And once you're in this dashboard, you can just create a new secret key and you can call it anything. So for this one, I'm probably just going to call it course video two for one and create the secret key. I'm going to copy this now. And once it's copied, I can just, yeah, I can just paste it in here. So this will be a password that's unique to you. And say you accidentally revealed this, what you can do is you can actually just hit the trash icon here called revoke key. And it basically disables the key. So you can't access it through this key anymore. So I'm not going to disable this, but I've made a couple of ones here that I'm going to disable. And yeah, I'm going to be disabling this API key as soon as this video ends. So let's just shift and enter and that runs this code. So your environment variable is now open in AIP. And this is just an example of how we call the API. I'm not going to use this as the example. I'm going to go back here and go to the playground and use this uh, example that OpenAI has provided. So in this case, let's just hit view code and then call it. And let's put that in here. Okay. So we can remove this open ABI key because we've already defined that up here. And now this response body in this content here, which is this part here, we can just say, what is your name? And I'll show you guys the other things after we're done with this. So as you can see, it does run, but it doesn't res return us with the response. So what I can do is I can just, uh, the, the whole value is uh, in stored in this response variable. So I can just print out response. And as you can see, it gives us a bunch of this data here. And the only thing we're actually interested in is this part here, where it says the role assistant. So notice how I said role equals user here, but here it's role equals assistant. The content is I am an AI language model developed by OpenAI. I don't have a personal name, whatever. So obviously this, this is the only thing that we want the model to output and everything here is just, uh, just something that we shouldn't be you know, using. So what we can do is we can just extract just the reply through this. And so this goes through the entire uh, JSON data and it just gets us the content here. So it's the same thing here. Let's so another thing you can do is, again, just um, everything that you do in this playground, you can do here. So you can put a system message here. And the way you do that is just by defining this other dictionary. And you put the role as system and the content as whatever the system message is. So here you can see your helpful assistant, um, you know, who really obsessed with potatoes. And shift enter again. It should take a little while, but we should be giving the output pretty soon. Yeah. So here, as you can see, it does assign that personality to it because you know it's says potatoes, but it also just completes the task as well. Uh, another thing that you can notice in this example is. I have the power to change everything that I've changed in this playground. So I have uh, the power to change the model, the messages, the temperature. And if you come up here, you can actually see that uh, everything that I changed up there, you can sort of just assign it in a variable and change it. I'm not going to be doing that because I don't think it's very necessary for this tutorial. But we can look through some more prompting now. So one thing to note is that GPT 3.5 doesn't really pay attention to the system message as much. So generally, whenever you want to assign a system message, you should use GPT 4. So let's go to this example here, which is few short prompt. So if you guys remember what I said about fine tuning in the previous in the slides explanation, this is sort of analogous to that when you're sort of giving the model example answers, you're scripting this entire conversation here. So you're saying that the system method is this, the user has inputted this, and the assistant has responded like this. So this didn't actually happen, 
but you're saying that this is like the ideal uh, response that the assistant should be giving you. And once you give it enough examples, it sort of learns uh, to, you know, output the answer based on how the user desires it. So here, let's just change the model to GPT-4. And we can run this code again. Yeah. So as you can see, it does give us this output. We can try this. Well, uh, we can try this. This is sort of a simple example, but we can try this maybe, maybe through. So I'll just, uh, <laughs> Yeah. So as you can see, like we can compare the output that it's given previously with the few shot prompting and now. And I would say like the output before was a lot more concise and informed than whatever this is. So again, another example of the short prompting where we can actually just assign the system message as something that follows pattern so that it, it enhances the, um, it enhances whatever it learns. So I highly recommend you guys to just go into this notebook, register your API key uh, by connecting with your card and just simulating a bunch of conversations and tweaking uh, a lot of these parameters here and sort of get a feel for it because there are no ideal set of parameters for every um, for every problem. Much like there is no ideal prompt for every problem, it's a process that comes from just um, you know keep uh, trial and error and just trying out a bunch of different solutions. So one thing I didn't mention so far is that like this API is actually built so. And the way OpenAI charges you for this, for using this API is through the number of tokens. So you can think of a token, as I've explained before, as three fourths of a word approximately. And so for every three fourths of a word, every thousand three fourths of a word, you would be charged differently based on what model you're using. So this, to this um, library here uh, sort of helps us understand how much we're using it, but a much better way to do this is just going through, uh, just going through your managed account and just looking through uh, how much you're being built because OpenAI provides you with all the data necessary. But here's just a way to do this programmatically. Um, you can just this is just something where you just copy paste the code in, and it helps you track. There's really no point in understanding what this means. Okay, so as you can see, it's counted. 129 prompt tokens. So you can just do the math and see how much that charges. So in general, the high-end models like GPT-4 are slightly more expensive than GPT-3.5, but I would say the price is um, pretty minor. It's like $0.03 or something per 1,000 tokens per one of the models. So that was it for using the API. And hopefully I've given you guys a much better intuition on how this works. So uh, one last thing that we can do is actually refining our prompt through LLMs. So as you can see, all of this was just asking it a question. And what we can do to sort of help with asking better questions is asking the model itself to make a better question. So what we can do is like, uh, can you phrase this question to be more Clear, concise, and to the point. And then you would just ask it, like, what is Python? Or that's pretty concise already. Maybe we could do, like, um, if I had three apples and my brother's father had four. How many do we have in total? And so we can just 
you know, around that. <laughs> yeah. So it makes it a lot more concise and you can use this as your prompt instead of your other prompt. And the reason why this is helpful because is because you can cut down the token size. And so, you know, OpenAI charges you less for using more concise prompts. So you can just say reduce this and hit submit. Yeah. So this is just a less token. So uh, over time, if you keep calling some prompt, you can just optimize it through ChatGPT itself. So that was it for prompting. Now let's go into actually applying this into some projects. Our first project will be cloning the entire ChatGPT UI and assigning it a custom personality so that we can interact with, uh, you know, a custom character. So let's send the user. We're going to be using the Chainlet package in order to make our ChatGPT clone. So Chainlet is basically this framework that allows us to build user interfaces really easy. If you have had experience with a package like Streamlit, you can imagine Chainlet is like Streamlit, but for large language model applications. So it comes with a bunch of different features and unique integrations. And ideally, uh, this is what our end goal is going to be as shown by this video. So just skip through. Yeah, so as you can see, it's a pretty, pretty feature rich user interface. And now let's get started building this. Okay, so now let's actually get started with uh, cloning this user interface. The first thing that we're going to want to do is import our chain that package. And the way we install it before we import is we go to the terminal and ignore everything that's happening here. All we need is uh, just a Python environment and you would do this command. So pip install chain lit. And we're doing this in the terminal tab. So once you do that, it should install all your packages. And if you haven't already, you'd want to do pip install OpenAI as well. And so this basically installs all the packages from external source that you can use to, you know, work with Chainlit and all these features. Okay, so now let's start. Our first goal will be to create a user interface that just outputs everything that the user inputs. Let's start by doing, defining a tag. So, so on message, you would define a function, uh, main, so be as asynchronous. Don't worry about async because that just means that uh, it's going to wait for the user to send the message. So it's not executed immediately. So basically this function main takes in uh, the parameter of message, which is supposed to be, a, which is going to be mapped to a string. So this message is going to be whatever the user inputs. And all we're going to do is we're going to say await chain that CL, CL dot uh, message. And then we're going to send this. And right now what it's going to do is it's just going to return an empty object. So what we have to do is we have to actually uh, specify what we want in the content. So in the content here, we can, uh, yeah. So in the content, we can just say message and we're saying message because that's what the user inputs. And I think, yeah, so this is about it for our basic example, what we can now do to run this and actually see our user interface is in your terminal again. Uh, you have to learn to get really familiar with your terminal because it's going to be really useful for the upcoming projects. So go to terminal and just run chain lit run and look at your Python files name. Mine is main.py here. So I'm just going to put main.py and then I'm just going to use the W flag. So you should really remember that um, you know, you should remember that you're not supposed to run a chain lit program with your run, but run button. So I'll make this more clear, uh, after we run this command. Okay. So as you can see, it's running on local host port 8,000. This just, just, just so that we have complete clarity. We will be using this green button to run some of our code 
but this executes it in a server and Chainlit helps us, you know, deal with the server and all of the backend. So all we have to do is just run that command. And now if we just put in hi, uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever the user inputs, the chatbot will output. So for some of you running this for the first time, it might not actually look like this. You might have a bunch of random text that's appearing there, like the welcome to Chainlit. And the reason why that's happening is because of the chainlit.md file. So here's just a sneak peek of what we're going to be covering in the future. But for now, go to this chainlit.md file. As you can see, mine is empty, but yours might be just full of a bunch of text. And all you have to do is that none of the text here is imported. So you can just, you know, control A and delete all of it. Or you can add something like welcome to this interface. begin by sending a message or something like that. So once you do this, hit command S, which saves it. And as you can see, because of our W flag that we put here, uh, the server actually watches for changes. So when, as soon as we hit the control save, it says file modified chain the .md reloading app, and it should be reloading. Yeah. Okay. So it, as you can see, it says, welcome to this interface, begin by sending a message. I'm going to say hi, and it goes away. But as you can see, it just outputs everything that we have. A couple of more options that we have in this user interface is hiding, you know, chain of thought and expanding these messages. But more importantly, you know, you can toggle between dark mode and light mode. I'm going to stick to dark mode for this tutorial. Okay, so now we pretty much have, you know, the basis and the user interface. All we have to do now is pass the message into into ChatGPT API, and we should, and then you know, just dot send um, the answer, right? So. Let's, let's do that now. And this is going to be pretty easy because we've already done this a uh, bunch of times in the collab notebook. All we're going to do is just, you know, wait for it. Okay. So here, all we're going to do is maybe just make something called response here. And in this response object, we're just going to put, uh, dot chat completion and dot create. And in this, we're going to put our model or uh, we're just going to leave that empty for now. And our messages, again, empty for now. And maybe our temperature as well. Why not? Temperature equals something. So you, you need to remember to put commas after all of them, except for the last one and commas between the messages as well. So the model can be anything you want, but I'm going to choose GBD4. And the messages is an array of dictionaries. So in the dictionaries, you will need to pass two parameters. You'll need a role and you'll need the content. And I'll explain what that is in just a second. So again, role or whatever that is, and then the corn bed. At temperature, you can just set it to, you know, whatever you want between zero and one or two. And once we're done with this, we gain, let's see what's missing there. Yeah, it should be fine. Okay. So, so since, so in our role, uh, key value pair, we can just put this as the assist step and here we're just going to put it as the user so as you can see here basically what happens is that this is the assistant message as you've seen in the chat gpt playground and this is saying that uh you, you're like asking chat gpt a question basically so in the content for the system message you can put you are a helpful assistant. 
And in the in the user message, we're actually going to pass in our message variable that's passed on by the user. And once we have this, we instead of you know content equals whatever the user message is, we're just going to uh, return the response from ChatGPT. Okay, so now let's run this again. Same command in terminal. Okay, so it's saying uh, no API key provided. Let me provide one API key though. Good. So maybe uh, we can just post it. Try it. And then we can just put this in. So let's give it. Save that. Hmm. Interesting. Just something went wrong here. And I'm not quite sure what went wrong. So let's try to debug this, maybe. Um, okay, so maybe what we can try doing is just turn this response into a string. And hit save. Okay, so let's, let's see if this works. Okay, perfect. So yeah, um, basically the mistake I made was that this was just uh, returning just an object, a JSON object, and the content only uh, supports strings. So as you can see in this object again, uh, let me just, you know, redo that. Okay, so here to my message, hi, it says content is hello, how can I assist you today? And obviously, we don't want any of this other stuff around it. And as I've shown you guys in the collab tutorial, all we're, all we're going to do is just uh, remove these brackets. And then we're going to index our way through to get our message. So we're going to go to choices. And then inside choices, we're going to pick the zero the element. And in the zero the element, we're going to go to message. And inside message, we're going to go to content. Okay. So all of this is going to be wrapped in an F string. So I'm just going to uh, put this like such. And then just remove this. And then put this here. Okay. Cool. So once we did. Once we do this, let's just put a call out here for save and uh, safety and then uh, save the path. So now let's try running it again. Uh, yeah, okay. So it works. You can, uh, uh, you know, tell me a short one line story. Yep. So as you can see, we've successfully cloned the ChatGPT user interface, and we can also uh, call our API through this and modify any of our par uh, parameters here to suit the content. Now what we're going to do is something interesting where we can sort of talk to the model um, that is assigned a specific personality. So what, what I mean by that exactly is we're going to be able to change the user message to something that changes its personality. So here you can say like, you are an assistant that is obsessed with how uh, maybe Legolas. All right. So once you do that, you can just hit control save. It should modify it a bunch of times. And, you know, you can just start by sending a message. So hi, and once we wait for a while, it should return us the output. 
So yeah, it, it follows the system message and it really pays attention to it because as you can see here, you know, it's obsessed with Legos. So this is how you can assign a uh, personality to it. And this is how, uh, if you've ever gone to GitHub training repositories, there's a bunch of these, uh, you know, different different uh, repositories that all they do is just, you know, change the system message to make it behave a certain way. And that's exactly how you're able to get this behavior without fine tuning. So next, let's address some limitations of this approach. So we have successfully built a working chat GPT clone, but there are a couple of limitations to this regarding the user experience. So there's no streaming involved and streaming is basically this live uh, token prediction of outputs that happens instead of just processing the output all at once and passing it directly. There's no generating messages um, mess, uh, you know, button or message that basically helps the user actually identify if the backend process is running. Because otherwise, he'll just have to wait without um, any confirmation on whether or not anything is actually happening in the backend. And additionally, after that, there is no backend context. And by that, I mean the user doesn't know what kind of LLM or what is actually running in the background. This third feature is pretty optional, but it's uh, very useful when it comes to debugging when we go into more complex uh, large language model systems. So let's see how we ideally want it to look like. This is from the official chain that website. As you can see, there is streaming here. You know, these tokens are being spit out live. There is this background step that I talked about. And if we just rewind the video again, uh, you can see that that stop task button there allows us to actually see whether or not this uh, LLM is actually generating and we are able to stop the flow. So how do we get here? The answer to that is through Langchain. So Langchain is the most popular Python library that helps us deal with LLMs. It has some pretty advanced functionality, uh, you know, excluding whatever we just talked about here. And we're going to be using this extensively in later parts of our course when we're going to web browsing agents and using uh, tools with agents. So anyway, let's get into our Langchain implementation now. Great. So now let's look into how to actually integrate Langchain so that we get access to all of those user-friendly features. This is what we're going to be working with now. Uh, I'm just going to, you know, stop that app that we just ran for running. And we're going to pip install, and this is very important, U Langchain. And what this U flag does is it basically installs the very latest version of Langchain. And the reason why that's important is because Langchain is a library that gets updated pretty much, you know, every week or so. So anything that works today might be depreciated or discontinued next week. And in order to, you know, keep all your dependencies in check, we're going to be having to, you know, update our Langchain. So we I just defined a random string here. So this template is just going to allow the LLM to think step by step as it does here. And the first feature I'm going to show you from Langchain is prompt template. So if you guys have ever worked with the Python format function, this is pretty much the same thing. What I mean by this is, uh, this is just vanilla Python. So I'm just going to do a uh, template dot format. And then inside this question equals, uh, you know, whatever you want, like what is one, two, three, four, whatever. So let's just, I'll uh, turn on this. Okay, my bad. Um, you're supposed to print this up. Okay, so let's just print this up. Yeah, so what it does is it takes this template variable and then it formats it to one, two, three, four. But how's that actually happening? Well, these curly braces indicate that this is an object that needs to be formatted. 
So everything inside this curly braces is going to be replaced by uh, what is one, two, three, four. And that's exactly what prompt template does, but it makes it a lot easier and a lot more LLM friendly. So we're going to get right ahead with the lag chain and chain that implementation. We're going to just define two tags here. We're going to do CL dot on message as well. And once we do this, we are going to, yeah, but it, so we are just going to create a main chat. So we're going to just define our main function here. And inside this, we're going to do our prompt equals something our LLM chain equals something. And then seal dot user session dot set our LLM chain to LLM chain. So LLM chain. You can set that to LLM chain. Okay, so now that we have that, let's actually uh, go into what we're doing here. So what on chat star does is as soon as this object of, you know, the chain that UI is deployed, here are the variables that we need to initiate. So I'll just, um, yeah, I'll just create the prompt here. So prompt template is the object. And inside this, we're going to put our template as template. And it takes some random dump. I take some template and with this, it takes an input variable. So input variables equals, you know, something else. So in this case, our template would equals the template variable and our input variable is the stuff inside the curly bracket. So that's just question. Okay. So that's it for our prompt. And now let's initialize what our LLM chain. So what is an LLM chain here? An LLM chain for now, you can think of it as something that connects the prompt with our large language model. So in this case, let's just, uh, you know, dip LLM chain. We're just creating that object here. And inside this object, we're going to define a bunch of uh, parameters. So we're going to do prompt equals something or LLM equals something and our streaming equals something and our verbose equals something. So I'm, I'm going to go through all what all of these mean. And the reason why it's showing that is because it needs to be commas. So our prompt is basically just our prompt, uh, which is the variable I defined here. Uh, and our LLM, which is going to be the regular open AI model, but there's a different way to define it now instead of, you know, going through the hassle of doing a bunch of different, uh, you know, API calls, all we need to do is just open AI and then we pass in our temperature, temperature here. And my bad streaming is supposed to be a parameter inside the LLM itself. So, uh, streaming, you can just set the truth and this would, you know, stream the output and temperature will set to one for now. After this verbose is basically uh, our hot process. This will make more sense when we cover the agents tutorial, but you can think of verbose for now as just this extra additional text that goes into and, you know, helps the LLM with reasoning. So the thought process that leads up to the answer. And then we're going to take this LLM chain and then we're going to store it in a user session variable called LLM chain so that we can access it on the on message call. So in our on message call, we're, you know, this, we've done this one already. Let's define a main, another main function and let our message be string, whatever. And inside this, we're going to retrieve the chain from our user session. So LLM chain equals CL dot user session dot get. So this time we, we did get instead of set. And in here, we're just going to put LLM shape, which is the variable that we passed in here. Okay. So that basically just gets us this variable across tags. And after we've done this, it's just pretty simple now. Uh, all we do is just 
uh, call the result, result variable. So instead of calling our model itself, we'll now be calling our LLM chain. So what we do is await LLM underscore chain dot asynchronous call. And then inside this, we're going to do our message and then call back. So don't worry about what this callbacks thing is. It just helps with uh, streaming. Uh, it helps with streaming because, you know, it just calls back and establishes a socket connection from what I understand of it. And then after we do this, all we do is just return our output as we've always done. So cl.message, and then we're just going to set that. And then here we're going to do result res of um, text so as you can see the although this may not save a lot of you know lines of code and might be slightly more we have a much more organized framework to think about things now because once we adopt this land chain framework uh you can you know sort of do stuff that's a lot more complicated than what we're doing within similar lines of code. So an example of this is what we're going to be covering next. Uh, you, obviously, you're not expected to understand any of this right now, but all of this is very close to uh, how many ever we're doing here. And this is infinitely more complex than what we're attempting to do here. So once we're done with that, let's um, go back and fetch our API key. Okay, so once we're done with just putting our API keys, uh, we can actually test this out and look at all of our new features. So let's chain the run and then chain the run on our file name here, line tune integration. Right, yeah, dot .py, and then we're just going to put a watch flag there again. So, just wait for that to run. Okay, great. So, now if we put hi, as you can see, we get everything that was in the video that I showed you. So, hi, what is your question about? You know, uh, the thought process here is, what is your question about? This thought process stuff is going to be more relevant once I into other concepts but this is basically the same thing you can just say uh, what is your name how are you doing so and it's actually streaming here and then passes us the final output but yeah so everything that you did previously with your API you can sort of uh, test out working with our system message here uh, you can test out working with different user messages, different parameters like top B, uh, etc. And now let's get into something that's slightly more interesting. We're going to be able to use this land chain framework to ask chat GPT questions on our own PDF and text documents that could be, you know, any size, like 2000 pages. So more on that now. So now let's talk a little bit about vector databases and embeddings. Here are some examples that you might have heard of. We're going to be using Chroma DB and some of the others for this course. So what are vector databases? Vector databases are basically this database or storage for specifically embedding information. Vector databases allow us to query and utilize the, this embedding information as fast and efficiently as possible. So what's an embedding? Well, an embedding is just this multidimensional space where all the similar objects are grouped together. So in this case, um, in this image, all the symbols that represent two are sort of grouped together. All the symbols that represent four are grouped together and all the symbols that represent nine are grouped together. So why, why is this important? Well, when you have the ability to group sim similar objects based on a bunch of different parameters together, you can build recommendation systems. You can build search engines. It, this is also used in LLMs themselves. 
in generative AI. And for this specific case, we're going to be using it for context window expansion. So if you remember from one of the previous slides in the introduction, I said that fine tuning is not a very recommended way of enhancing a model's knowledge. Well, this is where vector databases come in because while fine tuning has its disadvantages because of catastrophic forgetting, vector databases just simply retrieve the relevant context information for the language model so that it can use it. What do I mean by this? Well, let's go into this, uh, let's get a little more technical into this. So say I have this 2000 page PDF, which I want to use, and I have a couple of questions about it, and I wanna be able to ask ChatGPT or any other them uh, this question. In general, if you'd want to do this, I guess the naive way would be to just copy paste every single letter in that, um, in that book and just paste it into the chat GPT terminal window. But obviously this won't work because you'd be hit with a context limit because the, there's a max number of tokens that can be inputted into chat GPT and the way to get around this context, help it work with new information is where vector databases come in. So basically I'm just gonna put this PDF into a text splitter, which will split it into text chunks of equal length. So you can imagine like just five word sentences or a thousand word sentences. And once these chunks are made, they're put into something called an embeddings generator. And these embeddings are then stored in our vector database. So now what's cool about this is we can actually ask the question and the vector database performs uh, an action called cosine similarity. And what cosine similarity is, is it finds the nearest 10 or how, how many ever you want, uh, 10 relevant sentences within these embeddings. So the 10 closest sentences, and then it just outputs them. <clears throat> so that's what the embeddings and the vector database do. And this vector database returns those 10 relevant sentences and these 10 relevant sentences go into our question answering model along with our question so that it can be answered. And the reason why this is important is because we went from a 2000 page book to 10 relevant sentences based on any query. And to me, 10 sentences is obviously a lot more manageable and useful in a model than, you know, a 2000 page book. So why use vector databases? As I said before, like cosine similarity is the only function that vector databases actually perform along with storage. So why can't you just put all these embeddings into something like an array and do a cosine similarity function with them? It's certainly possible, but the reason why vector databases are just so popular and being used so much is because they have clever algorithms that help us retrieve all these relevant text information at super fast speeds along with uh, a lot more efficient memory efficient usage. Additionally, it's all also very convenient because we just we can just retrieve those ten relevant sentences through one simple function call. So this is going to be the architecture for project two, as I've already mentioned. We're going to be able to we're going to build this entire pipeline. And one very important distinction I want to make here is the difference between our embedding generator and Q and A model. If you remember from the number classification example, I told you that the task was digit classification and it's able to group those uh, you know, symbol, similar symbols together. This is very similar, but here you're doing that next, um, you know, that next token word prediction problem. And this is, there's an important difference here because the embeddings generator neural network and the Q&A model are very different. The embeddings generator neural network for this case, we're going to be using something called ADA2 because it's a lot more efficient and it's sort of, um, you know, the standard for generating embeddings. Whereas the Q&A model is going to be something like GPT-3 and GPT-4. Um, in, in theory, it is definitely possible to generate embeddings through GPT-3 and GPT-4, but ADA uh, tends to perform better and is a lot cheaper. So now let's get into the code. So now let's get some more hands-on experience with how vector databases work, basically. What we're going to be using for this tutorial is 
Chroma DB, which is an open source uh, vector database that we can run locally on our machine as pretty scalable for production. So the way we get started is we just do pip install Chroma DB and it should be installing everything. But if you ever face any problems with installation, and I say this because I have personally faced a problem of editing out here uh, when I tried to install this package for the first time, the way you fix that is running this command that I've commented out here. So if you do that, the you know the errors will just sort themselves out. Once we do that, we can set our Chroma client equal to you know just our Chroma DB so that we can start querying our, our question. So here we can do collection, and then inside this we do Chroma client dot create a collection. And you can think of a collection as basically this place where we store our embedding. So this is the actual uh, vector database itself. So my collection will be our vector database. This is supposed to be Chroma. Okay, and now since we say that it's supposed to be our vector database, we can add information to this vector database in the form of three variables. So there is a documents variable, there is a metadata variable, and then there's an ID variable. So our collection object contains all these three, and let's go through them one by one and understand them step by step. So document takes on a list, metadata takes on a list, uh, ID takes on a list. So document is the actual list of our documents. If you remember from the slide explanation that I gave you, all of our you know tokenized and split text go into this document. So with this, uh, this example, I can just say my name is Akshat, maybe. And another thing I could add is my name is not Akshat. And then we can, uh, we can, okay, so let's just do that. And uh, this is supposed to be documents, by the way, my bad. And after we've done this, obviously this, you can, you can put as many documents as you want. And here they're gonna put our metadata. So in this example, it's not really gonna be important. And I will explain to you why metadata is going to be very important when we uh, when we're able to, well, when we're able to build our question answering system. So for now, let's just put all of our uh, just sources. So it has to be one source per document. My source. And you know what? Maybe let's just change this to name is true. And here, let's set it to name is false. So this will not be. This will not affect any vector database retrieval or competition. This just tags along with the steps. And there each, you know, ID, um, each each document has to have a unique ID. So ID one, ID two. And once we're done with that, we can uh, sort of look into what metadata is. So in so let's just uh, imagine that we finished our uh, you know PDF retrieval problem which is that we have uh, successfully been able to use ChatGPT to answer questions on our PDF. Even if, you know, this model achieves state-of-the-art performance, it's still prone to maybe a little bit of hallucination. And there's obviously a risk of that happening. And sources help combat that because even if the model hallucinates, it will be forced to uh, sort of output the source from which it got its information. So even if it misinterpreted the information, the user can go to that source and find out exactly what uh, the source is and sort of interpret it themselves so that there is no misinformation being spread. So that's it for collection. And now we can, we can pass in a results object here. And inside this results variable, we can just query the collection. So collection.query and Square object takes in two things. It takes in query uh, texts. We're just going to put a singular text in for now. 
but you can pass multiple questions in here. And then end results. So end results is the number of results, obviously, and query text. This is your question. So here, this would be, what is my name, right? So once we do that, we can then uh, delete all this and then just say print results. Okay, so now let's run the code and see what this has to say. Okay, so it returns us with this. So what it's happening is it takes this collection variable, it queries it. So what that means is it takes the what is my name uh, string and it performs a cosine similarity function between what is my name and my name is Akshat. And it returns to me the distance, the metadata, the embeddings. There's no embeddings for now and the documents. So the embeddings are not being stored at the moment, but we will be using ADA in the next example to do this. But for now, imagine that, you know, this is something that was just learned. So what, what uh, the other thing we can do is, you know, make this uh, number of results equals two, and we can compare which one is more similar or closer to answering the question. So as you can see here, my name is Akshat has a distance of 0 0.83, but my name is not Akshat has a distance of 0 0.93. So since this distance is closer, you know, the lower the distance, the closer it is to answering the question, uh, this is going to be favored. And in a top case situation, we're going to be passing this sentence here into our large language model over this one. So that was it for, you know, just the fundamentals of vector databases. Now let's apply this and whatever we've learned so far in this course to something more exciting. We're going to be able to build a PDF and text bot that can answer any of our questions on a given PDF or text file of any length. So now we have everything we need to get started with building our first document question answering system, which is project number two. So for the sake of simplicity, um, we're just gonna be using uh, PDF and text files as input to our project, but certainly everything that you learn here is going to be uh, easily generalizable to you know any other text file that contains text. So before we get started, let's import the necessary packages. So there's this package here. And if you just skip to this one tutorial instead of wa uh, without watching the previous one, you'd want to pip install chroma db. Uh, pip install chroma. Chroma DP. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So, control Chroma DB. And once you do that, you're going to want to run this command here. This is very important, but only run it if you're facing any errors with, you know, um, if you're facing any errors with Chroma DB. So, anyway, let's get started. Uh, we just imported our packages here. And let's look into what's happening. So just a quick recap on our architecture. We have here that, uh, you know, this PDF gets passed into our text editor, embeddings generator, gets stored in the embeddings query. Uh, you know, vector database finds the closest um, set of 10 sentences to this query using cosine similarity. Then those 10 sentences along with the query are wrapped into the Q&A model and then your name model like GPT-4 or GPT-3, it just it then passes the answer out as our output. So let's look at what's happening there. So our text splitter, as I've said before, is you know this this element here, and we get to choose what the chunk size is, which is the size of the sentence chunk. So here I just put a thousand characters, but you can uh, you know you can experiment with different. Oops. And then we define our embeddings layer here. So OpenAI embeddings as a default uh, uses the ADA, um, ADA to model, and that generally perform uh, provides the best performance along with you know the cheapest cost. I think. So after that, this is just a welcome message. This is user interface, and here we've defined 
two functions. So uh, here we've defined a process file function as well as a doc search function. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom out momentarily to just, you know, give us a bird's eye view of what's happening. Okay. So the process file is basically uh, this, you know, this feature that la uh, this feature that chain that offers where you can just input a bug. So you can assume that most of this is just boilerplate to here. But after this uh, point here is where we actually call the text bigger. So everything this function is doing is just taking the, you know, taking the embeddings here, uh, taking the text picture and applying it on our PDF file. And then once we have all the chunks, you can then label them as sources. So more on this later, let's move on to our doc search. So doc search is obviously where we, you know, retrieve our data from our embeddings. So once we sort of split these documents into smaller chunks, we can then process our file here and, you know, set it in our user session. So don't worry about this too much. This just makes sure that uh, our docs are available to both the model and the client. And the doc search, uh, you should be pretty familiar with this if you've uh, gone over the previous segment. So all we're doing is we're just uh, using the retriever, defining our retriever here. And the Chroma DB takes all these embeddings uh, along with, you know, the model of embeddings and it just returns the relevant query. So that's what this, this does. Okay. So now is the actual, you know, chain that user interface interactions part. And I've divided this whole, uh, action space here into two functions. So let's just zoom in and see what each one, uh, is about. So one second. There we go. Okay. So here we're defining an on chat start tag. And basically what this does is you just um, pass in a bunch of different, you know, bar based stacks here. You can just put whatever you want. So uh, welcome to this space. You can use this to chat with your idiots. Okay. And so once we send this message, we can move on to, you know, solve the more important lines here. So here, as you can see, it says, uh, while files equals none, you'll want to ask for a file. And here's where you can change, uh, what kind of file you're actually uh, inputting. So after this tutorial, I would recommend you guys to do some research and then experiment with using CSV files. So here we're just accepting text and PDF with the max size of this much, but you can obviously ask for more and you know, just, just send that out uh, as a message. So basically once this is done, we can, uh, once the user has inputted a file, we then say processing and then the name of the file. And then we basically just call these two functions here and return all of that output to here. So you're just doing, um, my bad. Okay. So here. So you're just doing, you know, you're just setting our, we're getting our retrieval chain ready and setting it here. So more on the retrieval chain now. This is a new kind of chain uh, that we've learned in lang, lang chain. So the, before we just did a basic, you know, LLM chain, but here we're doing the retrieval Q&A with sources chain. So as I mentioned before, chains basically unite the prompt and, you know, the model together. But now we can add a sort of other layer of abstraction to this definition where chains basically combine prompts, LLMs and other functions to this, uh, uh, together. So in this case, it combines a retriever, which is, which are, uh, you know, these embeddings here. So this is our retriever, which is our vector database. Our model is the chat GPD, you know, just model. And our retriever is, you know, this doc search as a retriever function. So once we're done with that, we can then, you know, just pass in, pass this out and set this chain, save this chain into our user session so that our backend can actually access this. So now this is what the backend looks like. Let's, let's go through this step by step because 
we've pretty much done all the work already. You know, we've established everything here. And here's the place where we're actually going to call all our functions. So here, as you can see, this is an on message function. So whenever a message happens, uh, you would get fetch this chain, this retrieval chain. And then you would, you would basically just, uh, you know, just strip your API and make the answer presentable and then just, you know, give it to the user. But all this, we could, we could just stop it here. You know, we could just stop it here, but a problem with large language models currently is that sometimes very rarely they do hallucinate and make up information when the context length is slightly wrong. And the way we can get around this is to provide citations to the user about what's actually happening. So even if the large language model hallucinates, if the user is interested in doing further research, uh, which, you know, he should be for the sake of this example, he can just click on the sources button and then he can read what's actually, you know, the the actual retriever output. So uh, that that's what this section here does, where sources, you know, we just classify our sources here and it outputs our source. So all of this will make more sense once I uh, chain the done. Oh, bye. I don't think, I don't remember defining any open AI key here, so might ask me to do that. Yep, open API key. Let's just go ahead and get an open API key. So openai.com, login. And once you're in the login page, you can just hit API and then view API keys. So I've created one already, but I'm just going to create a new one, which I will definitely disable as soon as this video ends. So create secret flu. And if you'll just use this throughout the course for, um, or did I, okay. Okay, this should work. Let's let's try doing this again. Cool. Okay, I think I know what's happening here. So import OS. So generally when you're using packages, I think it expects you to, you know, give it in this form rather than what I've defined. So just so that it's easier for the packages to identify what the key is. So let's, for the last time, hopefully let's try this again. Yeah. Okay. So it works. We'll, and this opens up here. So welcome to the space. You can use it to chat with your PDFs. Good. So this is exactly what we've intended it wanted to do. So now what we can do is we can just drop in a PDF file. So what I did here was I just passed in, you know, this sapiens of brief history of humankind, just a short excerpt of it, a PDF. But since all uh, this process is running locally, you're pretty much unbounded by how much you, uh, data that you can uh, input into this model. So it will say that it's processing here and what processing basically means is it's putting these text things into chunks, is generating embeddings and passing the embeddings into the vector database so that we can, you know, perform all these steps here. So we'll just wait for that to happen. One note is that at the time of recording this, um, I don't think chain that supports the drag and drop feature into files, although it does claim to do that. Uh, so your best bet is to just hit the browse button and then choose the file in the, you know, window that it displays. So anyway, uh, sapiens, it's process. So we can, you know, ask it some questions. So a question from this book would probably be like, what is the in the theory? theater? And so as you can see here, it shows me the 
retrieval Q&A chain with sources chain and you know it should it sort of it sort of shows me its thought process here which is exactly what this is so let's just go deeper into this chain so the retrieval with sources combine is a combination of the stuff documents chain and the LLMs chain so that they can return our sources so let's just look into the actual output here and you know it so it, uh, it answers the question obviously but what's more important here and what's more interesting is are these sources so i can say you know source 42 it's not that great at formatting because you know the pdf is just an unstructured text and also what, tokenization and chunking could sort of affect the alignment but this is pretty easily you know fixed you can just remove extra spaces so Again, I recommend you to, you know, play with this and sort of test out what you can do to improve this further. What I would, you know, initially like you guys to work on is maybe removing these spaces between uh, between these text spaces here and just keep asking it questions and see how it responds with uncertainty as well. So if I ask it something like, what is sapio? So it is... Uh, Sapien respond in a poem with citations. So I have no idea what this answer is going to output, but yeah. So yeah, it, you know, sort of answers the question, but as you can see, it doesn't really respond in a poem, which is kind of a limitation. And you can sort of experiment with how well, you know, you can make these and how flexible you can make these. Uh, a quick fix to this would be you using an agent that first, you know, retrieves these sources and this answer. And then you would pass this back into the LLM so that it can make it a bomb. So you could, you know, experiment with that, although we are going to be covering agents shortly. So that's all for our Q&A with documents. So now we're getting into some of the more advanced things that we can do. And we're going to be looking specifically into the web browsing and agent capabilities of LLMs. So why would you want an, uh, an agent to sort of browse the web? Well, the reason is because there is a knowledge cutoff uh, in uh, the training data and you can't train a model on an infinite amount of data because that would be very expensive and time consuming. Instead, you'd, you'd want to train a reasoning engine rather than a database. And you'd want to train something that can just have access to all these resources and synthesize it themselves rather than having some internal knowledge base that, uh, that you know, can't be changed. Additionally, some of the information that you might train an LLM on uh, might be biased and might be susceptible to, you know, changes in the future, which it hasn't accounted for yet. And browsing the web helps us reduce this because it always has access to the latest information. So now we're going to go into agents, which allows uh, these LLMs to perform chain of thought reasoning. Uh, here's an example of what I mean. This is from the Auto GPT GitHub repository. Welcome to this brief demonstration of Auto GPT. Today, we'll be showcasing the AI's learning ability by asking it to research information about itself. Let's begin. And the program's first step is to use Google to find relevant websites to what it's researching. Now that the AI has found the GitHub repository for AutoGPT, it's open it for analysis. After scanning the website's contents, it has summarized them and will now place them in the AutoGPT.txt file we have opened. As we can see, AutoGPT can teach itself about different topics using the internet, 
allowing it to have a better understanding of the current world than ChatGPT. So, AutoGPT is what we call an agent, and the way it works is this really cool way where it prompts itself. So the user just gives it a prompt and it can formulate a plan and then input that plan back into itself and then output an action, input that action back into itself. And it can arrange all these chains of thoughts into pretty sophisticated workflows that it can use to answer questions. And now more recently, it can actually perform you know actions in the real world. So the first problem that we're going to try to solve in this basic course is what is RLHF? We're going to be, we're going to want to ask the agent this question and it should be able to use its tools to find the answer on the internet. The reason why it doesn't know the answer to what is RLHF is because reinforcement learning from human feedback or RLHF is a new concept that has only been discovered or invented in 2022 to 2023. So ChatGPT having its knowledge cut off in 2021. Uh, would not be aware of this whatsoever. So we're trying to empower it to sort of research and learn about these things so that it can answer us. So how are we going to do this? We're going to use Langchain's Archive uh, API, our integration to do this. So Archive is, an, is a platform that allows us to have access to over 2 million scholarly articles in various fields from physics to economics to computer science. And it pretty much details all the latest research and information that's available to us. Here is what the website looks like, just in case it might be a little familiar. And now let's go to the solution. So we need a model that can know its resources and utilize its resources. And furthermore, it needs to be able to plan how to use these resources sequentially step by step, prompt by prompt. And when I say prompt by prompt, I mean it can it should be able to prompt itself to finish the task without the need of explicit programming, as well as not being stuck stuck in loops. So thankfully, all of this is going to be covered or sort of has been taken taken care of by Langchain already. But um, as it has conveniently implemented for us a research paper called the React framework that we can just use um, to make any LLM an agent. So here's what um, something like an agent, uh, here's one algorithm that it could use. Uh, you can just pause this video and look at um, this in more detail. But now let's just start with a simple example and dive into the code. So now we're ready to actually implement project number three, which is going to be GPT Researcher. So GPT Researcher basically answers our questions on pretty much the latest fields of science and can provide us with citations if we ask it to. So here is what we're going to be using. If you haven't uh, ever heard of Archive before, it's basically this website where there's like a bunch of scholarly articles that everything from, you know, physics to math to economics. And it has pretty much all of the latest research. So let's get started. Here's the archive plugin or integration in ChatGPT and Langchain. And I've made a notebook. I, I made a notebook in your GitHub repository so that you can use it. So back, we're skipping ahead here. Let's just, yeah, here. Okay. So here is internet browsing. Let's zoom in a little bit so that we can see the code better. Okay. So we're just gonna import our basic functions here and we're gonna just define our OpenAI API key. So let's try to find it if I put it somewhere here. And we're gonna put this back into our I'm um, on internet browsing for me. So. Okay, so once we've defined the API key, we can just look through some of the basic things. This, this should look super familiar to you. You know, we've done this a bunch of times already. Uh, 
this LLM definition. And after that, we have this special parameter here called tools. So basically the tools, you know, parameter allows us to store tools that the LLM and the agent can access based on its needs. So one thing that you can do maybe after learning the other tools in this course is, you know, just separate them with commas and pass in some of the other tools like Replit. That's not exactly how you define it, but you can, uh, you can sort of integrate that into this toolbox. So once we define the tool, uh, we define a new type of chain, which is our agent chain. So as I've said before, a chain basically unites our prompts with our large language models and our algorithms. So in this case, the algorithm that we're using is zero short react description. So this is the algorithm that allows the LLM think and, you know, prompt itself to reach the right conclusions. So we're going to set the max iterations to five so that it doesn't, you know, get stuck in a loop and it doesn't, um, it, you know, you won't be burned too much for uh, your API usage. So we're going to just pass in our tools here with our LLM and then max iterations. We're both, we'll get to that and handling this, you should set this to true as well. So after that, all we do is just agent chain dot run with whatever question we have and let's observe uh, the output. So let's, let's try it on this. So while that's running, let's just look at like sort of the uh, preliminary steps that it takes. So this algorithm is called zero shot react description. So all we're doing is just asking it first word uh, is, you know, are that chip. And if it doesn't already know that, then it would identify an action to perform. And so the action to perform here is archive, which is our API that searches the research paper domain. And then you would input the word RLHF into our archive API so that it returns a bunch of, you know, research papers that are search results. And obviously this is not really presentable. I, I shouldn't have to, you know, look through all of this research to get my answer. So what it does is, you know, it observes this output under observation and then it has a thought here. So RLHF stands for reinforcement learning. So it takes in all of this research that it's just found. And then, you know, it, it just finds uh, itself an answer to this. So that's what, that that's how we're able to solve this uh, knowledge gap problem that we have. An additional thing that you can do here is, yeah, you can just ask it anything you want. So what is a black hole, for example? And it will give you the answer. So let's just observe what the algorithm is doing first. So it, sh it identifies that it search, uh, it should search for a scientific definition for that. It identifies the correct action. This will make more sense when you give it more actions so that it actually has to decide between what actions to choose. So it inputs the word black hole into the action. And, you know, all this B text here is whatever is returned by archive. So it looks at all this return text and then it thinks, meaning that it, it you know, it, um, it takes in all this input and then it just gives us an output based on what it thinks. So our final answer is a black hole is a reason, region of space time exhibiting gravitational acceleration so strong that nothing, no particles or even, you know, uh, electromagnetic radiation can escape from them. An interesting thing you can do here is you can query sort of the other types of um, data that come along with this research paper. So you can see like with the titles, you know, what, what were the authors in this paper and was it what, when was it published? So that's all for the archive tool. Let's move on to the other tool that I'm going to show. But before that, let's look into uh, chain lit integration to just show you how easy it is to incorporate agents into, you know, a presentable UI. So this is a chain lit integration. All of this just boilerplate, you know, 
And all this code here, we've already, we ran that in the previous Python notebook. So you can just copy paste it here. The other thing you need to remember is to store this in an agent variable and then retrieve this in the agent variable. And the answer should be agent.rally. Everything else is just boilerplate code. Uh, and yeah, this allows you to stream the final answer as well. So that's pretty cool. So let's now run our agent with uh, with chainlet. So again, go to your terminal and then just type in chainlet run internet and browsing. Okay. Chainlet. I'm done with quiet. I apologize for the overly long file names, but it's just so then I remember which one contains what. I should open up this in a bit. So yeah, as usual, same error. Uh, let's just copy this to our open API key back into this handbook here. And this time, let's make it a lot more convenient by adding that job gate slide. So should open it up again. And now it should be working. Yeah. So again, whatever we uh, just queried it through the agent.run, we can do the same thing. So what is RL HF? And, you know, I'm not familiar. So it's just using archive. And then it says title, whatever the research that it found. And then, you know, I now know the final answer. So this is the final answer. Again, what is a black hole? Yeah, so, you know, it answers the question for me and we can look at all the thought process. So one final note before we move on to another tool is this parameter here, which is verbose. And basically when you set it to false, all it does is it removes all this thought process here and it just gives you the answer. And it's useful in a production setting, but I think it's kind of fun to just look at what it's thinking and how it's able to come to those conclusions so that, you know, you can verify whether or not it's using the right thing. So another tool that we're going to use is human as a tool. So this is really cool because say your uh, agent sort of goes on the wrong track. What you would want to do is you would want to validate it and sort of tell it what it's doing wrong so that it can fix that thought process and then move in the right direction. Instead of having to just run once and then you changing the parameters, you can just talk to it and sort of make it work. And this is what the human as a tool, uh, this is what the human as a tool package solves. So this is just a simple, you know, scenario here. Uh, you can look through the code, but obviously the only difference here is that in the tools array, I've just put humans and LLM math tool, and I've just defined this math LLM here so that it can do the math. So let's just run the human as a tool.py, and I'll tell you exactly where I need. Again, open a open a key. I'll remember to add it to the other ones. So open a API key, and let's try running this again. Okay, cool. So it's working. Uh, so it says I need to figure out what the math problem is and solve it. And the reason why is because I wrote the question as what is my math problem? And basically what, all I can do is I can just say, if I have three apples and you have five, how many more do you feel? Have Danny. This is a very basic example, but obviously uh, it observes this and then it uses the LLM math calculator tool and it shows me that the answer is five, uh, answer is two. So the reason why this is cool is because you can use this tool, as I've mentioned before, in between its thought processes. So if it uh, thinks of a wrong solution, you can instantly give it feedback. And that's where you can sort of just add this human tool to your overall cluster of tools here. Another tool that we can check out is our 
um, a Replit tool. So this is the Python Replit tool. And I'm, I think you're sort of noticing a trend here where you don't really need a lot of code in order to deploy all these very complex uh, agents because Blackchain has got this covered for us already. But if you want more customization with your tools, we're going to jump into that a uh, little in a little bit. So let's just start running this now and I'll explain what this does. So while that's running, uh, Replit is basically, you can think of it as an alternative to Colab Notebook. So basically what it does is it writes Python code and the limitation with ChatGPT is that it can't run its own code, right? Because it's not a computer. So it takes that code, it puts it into REPL and it retrieves the output of that code back to us so that, you know, it codes for us. So here, my question was, what is the 10th Fibonacci number? And here's, you know, a list of Fibonacci numbers. Um, you know, the, it identifies that the action is Python REPL and the actual input is you know, Fibonacci. So this is the code that goes into the REPL and the observation is as such. So the thought is that, you know, it just prints out Fibonacci of them. Okay, so that was the Python REPL, REPL tool. Obviously, all you have to do is just combine this with uh, every tool that I've mentioned before in order to make it work. So another cool tool that we can explore is the YouTube search tool. So YouTube search tool, it obviously, you know, it does what it says it does. It searches YouTube. And in order to make this work, you actually need to install the YouTube search package. So let's just install that. And... The cool thing about YouTube search tool is that you can uh, sort of give it this framework here. So this is another way that you define a tool where you define an array of tool objects. A tool object is basically this, uh, you know, object that takes in three parameters. So in this case, it takes a name, it takes a function, and it takes a description. The name can be anything. I don't think it matters that much. The function is what um, what the activity that the language model actually does when it's called. And the description is super important because it tells it when to actually use it. So in this case, when you're asking for YouTube video links, you would want to call this tool. So that's why our description is you need to give it links to YouTube videos. And we wanted to put HTTPS and all of this stuff in front of every link to complete it because it only gives us you know, the URL address, like whatever it would be, it doesn't give us the YouTube link. So it's a lot more convenient to click on the link when you have that. So again, initialize the agent with all the tools of this stuff. And I'm just gonna ask it a simple question here, which is what's a Joe Rogan video on an interesting topic? So let's let's just try to run this. Have I put my open AI key in me? Nope, one second. Okay, so we have our open API key and let's just try to run this now. So as I mentioned before, you know, this, it just returns the root value uh, in our observation. So it just returns a slash watch. And what I asked it to do here is to put HTTPS YouTube.com in front of every link so that it's actually clickable. So our final answer is this. So let's just Click on it and see what it gives us. The Joe Rogan experience. I guess I'm talking about it now. I'm not. So yeah, it works. It returns to us the YouTube link. And I've shown you how to do this already, but all you have to do to integrate this into Chainlit is just copy paste all of this and replace this, this stuff here with, uh, you know, all this archive stuff. That's all you have to do. It's super simple. Let's go into more of the integration so I can show you what you can do to what you can do to research and explore more tools. There is the there is the Zapier Lang Natural Language Actions API tool that I recommend you guys to explore on your own. 
I'm not going to be doing this one because it's not the safest to show my API key for. So Zapier is basically the service that gives you over 5,000 different integrations. I'll be covering the National Language Actions API in a future video, but you know, you can sort of combine this with maybe a research, uh, you know, the archive research retrieval by making a bot that every, you know, single week, it just returns the latest research on a specific topic and it can like tweet it out, put it as part of your email newsletter. Uh, Zipier has all those in integrations handle. So last tool we're going to end on is going to be the shell tool. And once we're done with the shell tool, I'll just show you guys how to make your own custom tools. So let's go to the shell tool code is in the CLI GPT.py file. And this is sort of interesting because you're doing a little bit of configuration here. So you're taking the shell tools description. You're adding its arguments and you're placing these arguments with these so that it's easier for the model to execute the local commands. So what the shell tool does is basically what we're doing in this terminal, except ChatGPT can actually uh, run commands in our terminal, you know, create text files and all of that. So here's a basic example. Obviously, you know, we're just initializing the agent, uh, adding all of them. This should be a lot more familiar when I just do that. Okay. So once we do that, uh, we can just run the agent. And my question to the agent is create a text file called empty and inside it add code that trains a basic CNN for for e box. So as you can see, there's no, there is an empty .txt file from a uh, previous test found of this. So I'll just do that and let's run the code again. So CLI GPT on that. <laughs> I did I didn't have the open a AI key again. So let's let's do that. And maybe put it up here. Okay. So okay, th this won't work because it's before it or or so I'll just put this here. Okay. So let's let's run this again. Okay, so it's entering the execute chain. And this is interesting because uh, we can actually look at what exact commands that it's passing through. So that this is sort of a step-by-step -step, step sequential reasoning problem, where first it it uses one tool, which is the terminal tool, and and, and this is the command that it passes in. So touch empty.txt. And then once the text file has been created, it uh, puts all of this text into empty.txt and then you know it's thought is that and then it just opens it so here's all the code we're going for running that so let's just check if this has actually worked so empty.txt is here and yeah so it does have all the code that's required i'm just gonna end uh this tool section by showing you guys how easy it is to you know again put all of these agent tools inside Chamlet. So everything I'm doing here is just, you know, all of this stuff is boilerplate and all I'm doing is just copy pasting what I put in CLI GBD, all of this code here. And I'm just putting that in here. And then I put the agent dot run in here and store it in this variable. So that's, that's, let's just, uh, for once define our API key and then run it in chainlet so chainlet run on so I've, I've named this file combination of both dot pi and go for the w flag so but yeah we can basically do everything that we did uh previously in the previous Python repo, but just in chain. So we can say what is, or not what it's well, uh, to know, install. I will kill. Install numpy package. 
in my environment. So as you can see, it's running through and seeing what it can do. So it knows that the action is pip install numpy. So it just does that. And I wanted to show this to you guys in specific because this creates a really cool use case where you can um, you can sort of automate the process of learning how to code and uh, speeding up this process by using this. So say a beginner doesn't really know how to you know install packages or configure their environment. You can just use this terminal tool and launch it as an application that helps them do that. I think um, when it comes out, GitHub Copilot will be uh, or should be using this tool to make sure that it's very easy to manage dependencies and just make the LLM handle all the brute force work so that you can focus on actually coding. So that's it for the CLI tool. Now let's look into what is pretty exciting, which is our custom tools. So I'm just going to give you guys a super basic example of a custom tool, but know that, you know, it's pretty much limitless what you can do with this. So let's just uh, stop running this code. And let's look into custom tools. So one important thing here is you want to enable lang chain tracing to true so that it can actually trace through your function so that it knows uh, what to execute. So in this case, Again, uh, same imports, uh, same LLM initialization. And this is where you get customization. So now in your tools array, you can actually uh, define your own custom tool. So in this case, in the tool object, you can pass in a name, a function, and a description. Our name can be anything you want. And our function is the parsing multiplier. So this is just a simple function that multiplies two things together not supposed to multiply. Yeah, so it multiplies two things together. So an A and B. So when you pass in the input three times four, a general calculator would not be able to answer this because A, it's a natural language and B, it requires like a little bit of intelligence because uh, you know this is a number and this is a series of strings. So this is our multiplier function and then parsing multiplier basically takes in these two, it takes in a string uh, that the LLM inputs into the parsing multiplier and just splits it based on the comma and just extracts A and B so that it can multiply. So an example of this is basically the LLM, uh, I'll just explain what that or what I just said means. So the LLM would look at these functions and then it would out, it would, you know, act as an input in the function, it would probably do like 3 comma 4 as its input to the function. So this 3 comma 4 as a string, so this is a string, 3 comma 4 gets passed into our parsing multiplier where it's split into A and B. So 3 goes to A and 4 goes to B. And then you would return the multiplier of A and B. So since so you would just convert them into integers. So you just return three times four. So this is just one custom tool that you can do. Obviously, you can do a lot more complex things. You can call APIs on the back end. You know, you can um, hook it to email. You can do a bunch of stuff with this. So let's just run this LLM chain now and see what it shows us so custom tools. Fail to load default. Okay, so it works. I'm not quite sure why uh, this would error out, but it it, it does show us uh, the actual uh, agent chain. So here it says I need to multiply two numbers together because that's what it's doing, and the action is multiplier, and an input is t comma four. So the observation would be twelve because your action input. 3,4 gets passed into our parsing multiplier, which is our function here. Parsing multiplier splits it into A and B, returns the multiplied output. And so the observation is 12 because the output of our function is 12. And then it just says, you know, I know the final answer. Final answer is 3 times 4 is 12. 
So you can uh, change this function to maybe dividing. Obviously, it's not the most creative uh, change, but you know when you can define your own functions and allow this LLM to do things, the possibilities are pretty much limitless. Uh, interesting thing I just saw here is that I did define this as division, but you know it's smarter than that because I think it focuses more on the goal than the actual means to get to the goal. So it, um, you know, even though the observation is. 0.75, it prioritizes its own like common sense and knowledge, maybe through RLHF techniques uh, to make sure that its answer is not dry. So it's 12. So I'm just gonna leave you guys with this. This was the end of custom tools and the last segment of this course. I'll just leave you guys with maybe one thing to think about, which is the how the agents actually work right now is through re zero shot react description. So you can think of this as basically a pretty elaborate prompt combined with a recursive algorithm. So what I would leave you to is instead of instructing these values, uh, do you think there'd be a way to sort of fine tune the LLM based on the output of multiple agents? Because uh, fine tuning is meant for behavior changes. So could you just reinforce that uh, logical thinking behavior inside an LLM itself so that it won't have to depend on outside React frameworks in order to work. If you've made it this far, then congratulations because you just finished the course. Here's a list of everything that we covered so far. This course has been brought to you by loop.ai, which is software that allows you to create no code AI flows. In 10 minutes, you'll be able to perform all the actions that I've covered in this course so far, add a lot more with no code, as well as in within 10 minutes or less. You can deploy and embed a custom AI flow on any website and deploy and embed a custom chatbot on any website from Twitter to Instagram to your own personal website to Shopify. I appreciate you guys taking the time to learn from this course. If you're excited about the product, head on to loop.ai and sign up for early access. Subscribe to our YouTube channel for highlights of the course, uploads per section, announcements and updates on the product. You, the YouTube channel is also going to be the place where we're going to post any of our future courses. Follow us on Twitter to be the first to be notified about all of our future events and courses. And if you have any doubts, queries, concerns regarding any part of this course, join the Discord for assistance where me and my team are going to be working every day to resolve these doubts and conflicts. Once again, I appreciate you guys taking the time to take this course. Thank you.